Hello, my name is Barbara Kay, and on behalf of my co-hosts, Susan Pertnoy and the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, I'd like to welcome you to our program, Mosaic. We're on location today for a Lion of Judah luncheon, where the topic is Living Your Legacy. We'll be back with our program after this brief message. When I was young, I went to Jewish summer camp, traveled to Israel, and participated in leadership development groups. Today I'm teaching my children that being part of the Jewish community helps keep our heritage and traditions alive and vibrant, and can be fulfilling, exciting, and fun. At the age of 90, I started a second career, delivering meals to homebound seniors. Because I'm a senior myself, I know how tough it can get. If somebody is in trouble and needs help, we need to be there for them. As Jews, it's who we are. It's what we do. When my family needed help, we turned to the Federation, and they were there for us. How good it was for us to know that we are not alone. Community, like every gift, counts. Together, we can ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Federation and you, changing the world together. They say that caring for the elderly is a profession of the heart. As the director of home health care at Morse Life, I know that to be true. When I see an older person feeling safe and secure at home, I know I've done my job. To make a difference, to show compassion, dignity, and respect, it's not just our job, it's our mission. Morse Life Home Health Care. Morse Life Health System, honoring senior living. Our Jewish Federation has accomplished so much and still needs keep growing. You can help us do even more. Community, like every gift, counts. Together, we can ensure a vibrant Jewish future. Federation and you, changing the world together. Welcome back to Mosaic, and welcome to you, the guest speaker for the Lion of Judah. Thank you. You amazing woman. You're a founder, you're a, an author, you're a champion of women and children. Amazing. Barbara Shaman Greenspan. I should say Greenspan yes. Shaman, because that's your real name. Yes, <laughs> and that name stays forever. It stays. Barbara Greenspan Shaman. My mother would fell. She Thank would, you. I know. I saw the pictures in the book that you wrote. You wrote this remarkable book. Your Live Your Legacy Now. I can't believe it. It was fascinating. I fell into it. I really did. What motivated you to write it? I started writing this book as an ethical will to my children and grandchildren. Too frequently, we make assumptions that our children and our grandchildren and our friends and the people who think they know us really know the core of our being. Mm -hmm. And I really realized after speaking to other friends that when their parents died, they would say things like, oh, they left me this or they left me that, but I never truly understood who they were, what they valued, mm. what was important to them. So I decided it was time for me to write down the story of my own life and my family, because we'll talk more about it is a very compelling story. Mm -hmm. My parents were survivors of the Holocaust. My mother was the sole survivor of a family of 65 people. My father worked for Oscar Schindler. And I want to ensure that my grandchildren in particular would understand where Bubby came from what her real story was, not what she looks like today when she comes in with all the presents and gives the hugs and the kisses, but what road did Bubby travel to get to who she is today? You know, today we have uh, the Lion of Judah luncheon, which is really about people who are creating, in their own way, legacies. Mm -hmm. And it's really, I think it's perfect that they chose you as the guest speaker because you have such a story to tell. First of all, aside from what I asked you about the motivation. In 1989, you picked yourself up and with your parents mm -hmm. went back to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. Explain that trip. Toughest thing I've ever done in my life. 
It started in Philadelphia in 1988. There was an international gathering of Holocaust survivors from all over the world. And if you can picture this, thousands of people are marching to the Liberty Bell, mm -hmm. the cradle of freedom in this country. And my mother, who always said to me, I will never step foot in Poland. I will never go back to Germany where you were born. I can't do it. Looks at me and my brother and says, I've had an epiphany. We need to go back there. I want to tell you, in my own words, what happened to me. I wanted videotape. This is before Spielberg did Shoah Foundation. Mm -hmm. I want it in our family. So me door la door, they will understand the history of our people. Mm. What happens when evil is perpetrated and good men do nothing? She says, I want us to go to Auschwitz. Well, my brother's a physician. He looks at her and says, Mom, this is not a good idea. This would be much too traumatic for you. She says, no, I'm thinking about this. And after this gathering and all these conferences we went to, I want to do this. My brother turns to me and says, don't worry, she's not going to go through on this. My mother was a Bren. Do you know what a Bren mean, means? On fire. Fire. On yeah. fire, a dynamo. She calls me in three weeks. Write down this date. I have 100 Holocaust survivors and their children. We got a leader. We're going. Oh my God, my brother puts together every medication known to mankind, thinking mm -hmm. they're going to need it. Meanwhile, it was my brother and myself. We took all these meds on the trip. And we go to Auschwitz because my mother said, while we're alive, we need to tell you what they tried to do to us, how we resisted, how we became resilient and able to lead a new life afterwards, and to tell you the story of our lives before the Holocaust. Because most people look at survivors and don't realize there was a life before the Shoah. So I want you to go to my street, show you where I went to school. I want you to understand everything. Well, that took my breath away. And the day we went to Auschwitz, I couldn't even get dressed. I thought, do I wear black for mourning? Do I wear white mm. to stand up like a re new birth? Right. I said to my mother, who had so much wisdom, Ma, what do I wear? She said, you wear your Jewish pride, and you stand up and feel proud, because not only did they not have the final solution, look at us. We're here, we're strong Jews, we're Americans, and we live great lives. That was our solution to the problem. Well, walking through Auschwitz was very tough. Can you imagine this? We have a docent taking us through Auschwitz, and there were five survivors of Auschwitz in our group. Every other minute, a survivor would stop the docent and say, oh no, your script is wrong. I was there that day. Let me tell you what happened. It was chilling. Really? It oh, was wow. chilling. Well, here's a story I have to share with you. My mother used to compulsively brush her teeth. I was going to ask you about the toothbrush, because you wrote well, about it. Well, yes. The toothbrush is a very critical thing for me. You know, you think it's just a toothbrush. We're walking through the museum in Auschwitz, and if you've been there, you know the Nazis like to collect things. Mm -hmm. So like at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, they had the suitcases, the shoes, eyeglasses, the shoes. the shoes. We're walking through, and my mother looks at me and says, Honey, I hid a toothbrush in my clothing when I came here. They had already taken everything from me. But I took this toothbrush, and I would try be, just to put it over my teeth to feel human. I didn't have toothpaste. I didn't have a bra, you know, water. But it just made me feel human. It was my way of resisting. I get here to Auschwitz. They take away my toothbrush. She said, I've lost it. It was my last vestige of my humanity. Well, I felt awful, you know why? Mm. I used to make fun of my mother. Ma, why are you brushing your teeth again? She could brush her teeth 10 times a day. Before she died, she had dementia. She would make the caretaker take her to the bathroom to brush her teeth every other hour. That event was so imprinted in her mind that in Auschwitz, losing everything and this toothbrush took on such significance. So I ran out of the museum. Mm. I was so shattered and so upset, so embarrassed about how I had reacted to her, but she never told me the story about the toothbrush. So I'm standing in the courtyard, and there are a group of teenagers on a field trip, and they're laughing. And I'm thinking, who could who are come? They? Yeah, who could, laugh. Such chutzpah. Who could come to Auschwitz? This is not Disney World. Mm -hmm. And then I hear German. Well, I was born in Germany, and I speak German. So I go up to them, and I say, 
do you understand where you are? How can you behave this way in Auschwitz? And they laughed more. And that moment changed my life forever. At the time, I was running a national company recruiting senior level healthcare executives and physicians. And I loved it. I didn't think a baby boomer could ever run a company like that. I was making good money and I was loving meeting the CEOs of the companies. I had hit my professional stride, but my life changed. I realized as the daughter of survivors, I could not live in a world where young people could laugh at a place like Auschwitz. Where was the respect? Where was the compassion? Where was the caring? And at that moment, I created a thought in my mind that I would go back to Philadelphia where I was living at the time and create an organization that promotes respect, kindness, caring, and teaches young people to do morally responsible things and get involved in what we call tikkun olam, making the world a better place. And at that moment, I birthed the idea, champions, champions of caring. Now notice, I'm a Jewish bubby and mother, not champions of academics, not champions of athletics, but the heart. Why aren't we putting a premium on the importance of developing character in our youth? Is it not the most important gift we can give our children? Would the world not be in a better place if people led from the heart? Because you know the perpetrators in our world are not stupid. They're actually very bright. Dr. Mengele was bright. The people who bombed the World Trade Center were bright. They were just evil. So if you don't connect your brain with your heart, it's a very frightening world. Philip Wiesel said the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. indifference. How do you teach the children to have this ethical component? Well, Thank you for asking that. I have worked with a team of educators for the last 20 years in Philadelphia, creating curricula that really promotes these pro-social behaviors. We look at a continuum, and what I say to young people every day is every minute of every day, you have a choice in the behaviors you can make. You can become a perpetrator by doing evil to someone else, bullying, mm -hmm. gossiping, mm -hmm. it's a choice you can become a bystander. You can watch this behavior happen and just walk away and do nothing. Or you can become a champion. You can become someone who's an upstander, who speaks out, who says, no, I don't want this behavior. I am not gossiping. I am not going to bully. I am not going to be violent. I'm not going to hit that kid the way all of you are doing. So kids frequently say to me, you know, can you be all of these in one day? I said, you can be all of these in 10 minutes. You could be gossiping about your friends. You could walk away from a scene, and then you can do something nice. I said, but here's the cue in life. You can always reflect on what you're doing. And if you don't like where you are on that continuum, change it. Do what my mother used to call the mensch test. <laughs> Become a mensch. Instantly reflect on, do I like me when I'm doing this? And if the answer is no, change it. So every day we wake up and we have decisions to make and every night we can reflect on where was I on this continuum and we were, we celebrate young people. You know how you're celebrating the Lions of Judah today? Yes. We celebrate youth in the same way. We have the champion of the week in these classrooms and do you know where I'm doing this? In the toughest inner city schools in Philadelphia. Why? Because my heart goes out to this population of young people. They see no hope for a future. When I come in and lecture to them and ask them, where are you going to be in five years? You know what they tell me? Dead or in jail. I want to change that. Okay, well, you've changed 10,000 lives at this point. Yeah. Well, we're going to be back with the remainder of our program right after this brief message. What if you could change the world? You can. We can do it together. With the Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County, you are here and we are all connected. Together, we can enrich Jewish life, care for vulnerable populations, and build global Jewish community. That's what we do every day, here at home and around the globe. It was a shock when my smart, strong husband had a stroke. 
His mind was agile, but everything else failed him. I didn't see how he could possibly recover. But through patience, skill, and compassion, the caregivers at Morse Life brought him back to himself. They brought him back to me. Morse Life Short-Term Rehabilitation. Morse Life Health System, honoring senior living. Welcome back to Mosaic. Welcome back to you, Barbara. Listen, you were talking prior to the break about the fact that your parents, your home, your atmosphere, your environment, the dramatic events of your life have changed you. Explain one thing that you wrote about in the book, which I think shares the quality of your parents' life. Your parents put a lot of money into a very, very good friend's account. And what happened? Are you talking about the money that was lost? Mm -hmm. You know, in life you get a lot thrown at you, good and bad, but every opportunity is a teaching lesson. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, sitting in Palm Beach, it's uh, and I say the name Bernie Madoff, I know everybody in the room mm -hmm. would get tightened up. Well, we had our own little Bernie Madoff, not to the degree of Bernie, but a man who took a lot of money in a, a good, Ponzi scheme, a, good friend. a very close friend, mm -hmm. a very dear friend, who took a lot of money from my family. We loved him, we trusted him, and we lost a lot of money. But this, that's not what I want to focus no. on. What I want to focus on is I was living in Philadelphia and my parents were living in New York, and I got the call that this whole Ponzi scheme had come to the fore, and the FBI was involved. It was a horrific situation. And I had to go tell my parents, who at the age of 80 were to find out how much money they had lost, mm -hmm. which they could never recoup. And I went to New York, and I called my brother. I said, meet me with Valium, with any kind of drugs. This is going to be horrendous. We walk in. And I say to my father and mother, please sit down, I need to tell you something. And I tell them that we lost, within our family, each of us, the amounts of money we lost. And my father looks at me and says, I want to tell you something. Your mother survived Auschwitz. I worked for Oskar Schindler. I was on a death march. You don't say Shiva over money. Let's explain what Shiva is. You do not, when you bury the dead, in the Jewish tradition, you say Kaddish, which is the prayer for the dead, and then you sit Shiva, which is the, a week of mourning where you, don't, you, you sit on a low chair and, and your mirrors are covered. You're in an active state of mourning. He says, you do not say Kaddish over money. Done. I was beyond startled, and I thought, how right is my father? I'm going to destroy myself or let them destroy themselves. He goes, after what we have been through? And I looked at my mother, and my mother said, Mamala, he's right. We're going to have dinner. Come to the table. But you don't know the rest of the story. I do. Oh, you Tell do. it. <laughs> so this was like one of the toughest days of my life. <laughs> and I had just bought a brand new Lexus. And I walked down to drive back to Philadelphia in my brand new Lexus and I can't find it. It is not on the street. And I'm walking up and down the streets. Someone stole my car while I was telling my parents about how much money we just lost in this Ponzi scheme. And I go to the police. This is the best part in Riverdale where they live. And what do they say to me? Why do you people drive such fancy cars? <laughs> this was the policeman's way of comforting me. And I looked at God. I said, God, there's a lot of humor in this world, but this is really over the top now. And I had to get a rental car, drive back to Philadelphia. So I lost all the money and someone stole my car. And but that it, was that day. Yeah, but it taught you a how, lot a about lot. resilience. And that was really the basis for Champions of Caring. Well, you know what it was? Now I have to tell you another story, which you won't believe. I don't know if it's in the book. I start Champions of Caring. And they, kids had to write me a 500-word essay of why they were worthy of being designated it's as in a the champion. Book. <laughs> and 
It's our first event, and I have a judging committee made of all these prominent lawyers and doctors and people in Philadelphia, and they're meeting me at the school board. But I had a business meeting in Manhattan that morning, and I go to the meeting, <laughs> and I come out. My car is gone. Right. <laughs> Second car stolen. And I have to be in Philadelphia at 6 o'clock to judge these applicants. We had about 800 applications and we had a catered meal. I don't have a car. <laughs> so I get a car, I rent a car, it's pouring rain. I get there, I'm drenched. And I start, I cry. I get up and I say, I'm so sorry, I'm a few minutes late. And I tell them the story. I say, and that's why I created Champions of Caring. Because there will be evil people in this world. There will be people pulling you down. But what I've learned from my family, you pick yourself up, there's resiliency in your life. And that's what this organization is about. Teaching good values, teaching character, and teaching resiliency. Because you know no one teaches resiliency. Where do you learn resiliency? Life kicks you, you gotta get up. You know something, Barbara? I wish we had another hour and a half because what you're saying is brilliant. And actually, it was a joy to have you here. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Welcome Vivian Lieberman. You are a devoted philanthropist, a Lion of Judah, and you have the unique distinction of being an endowed Lion of Judah. Before we talk about that special aspect, I wanna know about the history of the lions. The Lion of Judah uh, started in 1972 in Miami, Florida. Uh, two women who started it were Kipnis and uh, Wilson Kipnis and Friedland. Uh, they had the idea of making a lion something special for the women and they started the pin, which is a very important pin. In 72 there were only 400 lions nationally. Now there are 17,000 lions around the country. And every two years, there is a Lion of Judah conference where all the women get together from all the different communities. And it's quite a sisterhood. When you see somebody wearing the lion pin, you, you have, um, you know you're a you sister. You have a connection. A connection yes. with them. And it has really brought together a lot of women. Uh, in our community especially, we ask the men, even if they give a family gift, to make their wife a lion because it's a very special distinction. It really is, and I think we've made it easier to become a lion. I think it's called a step-up lion. Yes, our community, I think, actually started the idea and I know for a fact that there are lots of other communities around the country that have followed us because it's such a good idea. The first year when you're a step-up lion, you give $3,600. The second year, it's $4,800. And the third year, it's $6,000. So it's a little bit easier to step up from your current gift and become a lion, and it's been very, very successful in our community. Now let's talk about endowing your lion. Endowing means that you perpetuate your Lion of Judah gift as a legacy after you've died. Why did you choose to do this? I chose to do it because it's a very important part of my giving. The Lion of Judah means a lot to me, and this way, I, when I'm gone, it will still continue my gift. You, I endowed for $120,000, so 5% of that is $6,000, so my gift will perpetually be given. When we start the year, the campaign, we read off at the luncheon the names of the women who have endowed, so they are still giving their gift. And you have to know that it's very simple to do it. There are many creative ways of going about endowing your gift. There are, and you don't even have to be a lion at the time to endow a Lion of Judah gift. Exactly. Um, there are people who 
our lions and they endow and then circumstances change so they can't keep giving it but when they pass away their gift will be given and they are uh, invited to all our lion events and we appreciate them. There are also a lot of ways to do it uh, by will, by life insurance. We have professionals that can help. And at the Jewish Federation? At the Jewish Federation. We have a legacy department and they are great at helping people. And it's, it's a conversation that might take a while but it's a very important conversation. It really is because we need, we need to perpetuate our Jewish community and what better way to do it than, giving, than by giving a gift of legacy. Right. What, where did you get your, your charitable in, insides? You know, it's very interesting. I was brought up not in a home where I really saw it. A lot of people were raised in a charitable home. Unfortunately, my parents were victims of the Holocaust as far as coming over to this country, and they made a living. So charity wasn't part of it. They needed to make their ends meet. But I went to Israel in 1993 with a, a miracle mission from Detroit, and I saw all the needs. And I don't know, I just, became very impassioned by the needs. And when I came to this Jewish community in Florida, I got involved. And that's the way to make yourself passionate about your giving. Well, your, your involvement is very <laughs> widespread in the Jewish community, and we really want to thank you for everything that you do. Well, I love this community. This community has given I have given to this community, but the community has given a lot to me. And I appreciate all the wonderful people and all the wonderful things this community does. Being from another community where I was a Lion of Judah there, uh, also I was endowed there, but this is my home now and this is where I give the majority of my gifts now. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. How important is it to endow your lion? I can't tell you anything more important than establishing that as your legacy. It's wonderful what they can do with it. I was so proud of the people today. And I'm proud of you being with us. Be with us again next week when we have another look into the Jewish world. Goodbye from Marseille.